Yusuf, how significant really is this step uh, for the bloc in its aim to reduce or even end reliance on Russian suppliers? Uh, well, thanks uh, for having me. Well, I guess that's what should have been happening. In fact, the EU, one of the weaknesses in the EU energy uh, sector is that there is no unified energy policy. And that's what has actually made the transition um, a lot slower because we have very much divided energy policy across the European Union, whether it's in Germany and France and Netherlands or Switzerland. And I, get, I think this is a, the first steps towards making the energy sector in the EU far more resilient than what we have seen before. Now, when it comes to the, uh, the uh, unifying the, the policy or having the, the, mm -hmm. the purchases or the imports as a block, I think here we there are something like 2 million barrels of oil that comes from Russia. And on top of that, there are between 2 to 3 million barrels that comes as petroleum products, also mainly that comes from Russia. Now, if we have alternative suppliers like Qatar or the U.S., or I think here there, there would be a far more... Uh, let's say, a more smoother transition towards reducing dependence on Russian supplies, given the tragedy what's happening now in Ukraine. And I think that will also enable the, the European countries to, to have far more and easier agreements among themselves when, when it comes to reducing their dependence on Russia. Because if we look at, for example, Finland, something like 80% of their mm -hmm. energy supplies come from Russia, Lithuania or Belarus. While Germany is just something like 30%. So I think here, exactly. this is a very important step towards moving, reducing dependence on Russia. Interesting, Yusuf, as you say, more coordination now, more resilience within the European Union. But how difficult would it really be for Europe to find alternative sources in the short term, but also in the medium uh, to longer term, especially for the countries you're mentioning? I mean, Finland, but also Germany, the Netherlands, Poland. Some countries rely for more than 90%, 80% on, on Russian oil and gas. How difficult would it be? Well, I don't think it's uh, it's very easy to implement that or to wipe off Russian supplies very quickly. Uh, because if we look well, well, the alternatives, where is the spare capacity? Qatar might have some uh, some spare capacity left when it comes to gas. Um, maybe the Algeria, but for Algeria, I think there needs to be a construction of a pipelines. So perhaps Qatar and Algeria, but that needs some long-term contracts. And also, because Qatar, you're mainly exposed to India and China and Asia, Asian countries. So there needs to be long-term contracts signed with you of that kind of place, their current customers. And that, so this is some, what if we talk about Russia. Then we also have Algeria that needs the infrastructure. Um, then that's in, in terms of gas. But in terms of oil, I think he, he, this is the trickiest part because very limited spare capacity left, and that's mainly contained in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. Mm -hmm. One trick part, one tricky part here is that the Russian oil isn't easily replaced by every, any supplier. You need, and the European refineries are very much config, configured to process Russian oil. That is kind of that kind of oil that is medium density that gives you far more diesel compared mm -hmm. to alternative crude. So in a brief and bottom line, the U.S. cannot replace Russian oil. So you need Saudi Arabia or Middle Eastern oil. Perhaps they would think about Iran or other alternative oil coming from the Middle East, perhaps even Venezuela. So but I think this is a not an easy part of the long term. And I don't see and a, a quick solution towards replacing right. Russian oil supplies in the meantime. But perhaps they can go away with gas much quicker. Interesting. As you say, very complicated, more so for oil than gas. Yusuf Al-Shamari, many thanks for being with us today. Always a pleasure.